Good afternoon and welcome to today's diversity and inclusion webinar. My name is Stephanie Hurst and I'm the member program specialist for the National Apartment Association. Thank you for joining us for this incredibly important topic. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping points. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the diversity and inclusion resources page of the NAA website early next week. Uh, during the discussion, you can type questions into the chat box on your screen, and we will share those with our presenters. Uh, we also have left time at the end uh, for any additional questions. And now I will turn the microphone over to Brittany Jews, a member of NAA's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, to introduce today's fantastic speakers. Brittany? Good morning, everyone. So we have an amazing uh, group of people who are gonna be speaking, Alicia Anderson. Alicia Anderson is on a mission to motivate and invoke change through the power of diversity and inclusion. She is an accomplished motivational speaker, corporate inclusion coach, and the RVP of sales at NOP, a multi-family CRM tech platform that helps leasing agents connect with renters and property managers, understand how their business is performing. Anderson holds a European master's degree from KU Leuven, Belgium, in adapted physical activity, emphasizing the benefits, practices, and principles of inclusion. Anderson is a tennis player, a cyclist, an identical twin, and has been wheelchair bound since birth. Born with sacral agenesis, her mission is to spread the power of diversity and inclusion to inspire all people in feeling limitless and living up to their fullest personal and professional potential. Using her voice to share her journey, Anderson aims to help communities, communities, companies, and organizations understand the true benefits inherent to building a diverse and inclusive, inclusive society. Our ops of, we have Steve Wunsch. He is a senior a director of business development for LEAP, a free security deposit replacement and rent guarantee platform that boosts NOI and increases physical and economic occupancy. Steve is also a professional facilitator in leadership, sales, and customer service. He is a national speaker and has worked with multifamily companies to enhance, improve, and train their organizations to improve performance. He began his career in multifamily over 27 years ago as a leasing consultant and has served the multifamily family in operations support as well as the supplier side. You guys, please help me welcome Alicia and Steve. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, Br Brittany did all the heavy lifting this morning, getting us started. So we really appreciate that. And thank you, Brittany, for all the work that you're doing with the Arkansas Apartment Association. I know they appreciate your, uh, your work as president, and um, we appreciate all that you contribute to the affiliate there in Arkansas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. So um, I've not only been friends with Alicia, but I actually had the opportunity to work with her uh, at Knock. Not only does she tear up the floor as a sales RVP of sales, but she is an amazing speaker. Um, I don't want to waste any more time. I want to get to the good stuff. So Alicia, take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. And I just want to, you know, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about this and bring some light and include disability in the DEI um, conversation. So I'm excited to, to get going. Um, I guess to start, maybe I'll share a little bit about myself and my background um, in, on inclusion. Um, so my journey on inclusion started literally from the moment my cell split into two and I was born alongside my identical twin sister, Regina. And, um, you know, from that very moment, we, it was apparent that we were twins. We have all of the same, you know, characteristics, hair, eyes, all of those things, but she's able to walk and I'll never know how that would be. Um, my parents were not expecting to have twins um, and especially one that was going to have major medical issues like myself. And um, over time, um, you know, we've just been on this mission to fully include the other in life. Um, and it really comes from 
caring deeply about somebody. And that's the core mission of my, my, my value proposition when I'm talking about inclusion is we have to care about the other person to really put in that effort um, mm -hmm. that it requires to um, continue the process, um, this ongoing process of inclusion. Um, and when I was born, I was born kind of on the cusp of the exchange of segregation of people with disabilities to inclusion. And it was way before inclusion was ever this thing in society that we're all sort of aiming for. Um, and so my parents had to really be advocates for me to be included in every aspect of life. Um, and their main goal was simple was just that was for me to have the same opportunities that my sister would and vice versa, meaning when I went to wheelchair tennis camp, she would be the only able bodied kid and when she would go jump on a trampoline, I would find a way to do that as well. Um, we would never leave each other behind. Um, mm -hmm. And so like when I was growing up in this time during these ideas, I was an, on an experiment of inclusion. And so through my life, um, it's just been this ongoing um, adventure to see um, how much more we can tap into this and, and, and you know, accomplish. Um, and being that first generation to face like the raw elements of inclusion and integration, there was just so many no's um, instead of yeses, let's collaborate and find a way that works for everybody. Um, and that's the key point is this is a collaboration process, whether it's at work or in life or in love or any aspect, like inclusion of somebody else is collaborative. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, th that's my background. And I've just been on this, this journey to, to advocate for inclusion, to share my experiences um, and hopefully open doors and widen doors for people that might follow me um, as I, I embark on this adventure in my life. And I know you're going to do that very well, Alicia. You know, having shared some good time with you and, and watching you kind of build this platform of inclusion has really opened my eyes to the fact that, uh, you know, the conversation around DE&I is often not inclusive of folks in the disability community. And so I think it's important to have these conversations today. Um, you know, on the screen, we've got this statistic that says one in four Americans are going to be impacted with disability. And I'm sure your folks, when your mom was expecting, had no idea that their life would be one of those one in four Americans. Can you talk to us a little bit about that one in four theory uh, and what that could potentially mean for some of the folks in our listening audience? Yeah, I mean, what it means is it affects all of us. The statistic of one in four of us will be affected by some sort of physical disability that will affect our life in one way or the other, whether it's for a moment in time, a broken leg, for forever like me, or any time in between aging, illness. There's, there's so many disabilities. Most of them um, you are not even visible. And having the conversation and including um, disability in the diversity and inclusion um, conversation is so important because it crosses all barriers and all lines of the inclusion and diversity conversation because it can affect the hard truths. Like it can affect yeah. anybody at any moment in time. And so, yeah, I'm just trying to share my perspective and so in um, that aspect that this isn't a me conversation, the person in the wheelchair, it's a we. So we're yeah. prepared and we understand um, that it really is in inclusion of people with disabilities is for, is for all of us. Yep. You know, I think people are um, familiar with, you know, some of the elements of the diversity and inclusion and equity conversation when it comes to, you know, race and some of those different conversations that are real forefront these days. Um, I don't know how many in our audience are aware that there was like this civil rights movement in the 70s around Americans with disabilities that actually created um, an act of Congress. Can you share with us a little bit about that history and how it's sort of propelled you into this arena that you're currently working through? Sure. I mean, the history is big. I mean, it's got a, a huge story. Um, it's right up there with the stories of the civil rights movement and women's suffrage. 
Um, when I was born, I was born in 75. So that was, it's aging me, but that was literally on the cusp of the exchange of this. And before these movements, people with disabilities were not included as a class. They were not even in a marginalized group. They were just not, I mean, not, not included. And so this was really lucky timing for me when I was born. My dad would tell me as a little girl, you have no idea how lucky you are to have been born right when you were, because it's going to allot you so many more opportunities in life because in 73, the Rehabilitations Act was passed by these advocates. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an act that, that prohibits discrimination based on disability and federal programs and infrastructure. And this was fueled by a society back then that wanted to make love and not war. And for the first time in history, it cracked open the door to inclusion also for people with disabilities. And, um, you know, it was as if it was happening in preparation for my birth. And <laughs> these activists, they led these charges for the Rehabilitation Act and later led to the Americans with Disabilities Act, which we are all very familiar with in our industry. Um, and that was only passed in 1990. Um, and that is such a, it's a short time ago, um, but it prohibits discrimination and it guarantees that people with disabilities have the same opportunities in life um, and also have the same access to get there. And, you know, these, these laws are sometimes punitive. They're looked at as punitive. They're feared. They are something that we don't want to touch necessarily in life, in our industry, at work. You know, they're hard conversations to have because they're personal. And we're talking about physical, um, you know, physical issues with individual people. And we're dealing with humans and it's so personal. And, and I'm trying to shift the conversation of ADA being not this punitive thing, but especially in our industry, it's an opportunity to yeah. allow us to access life, to open up opportunities for homes and livelihood and the ability to go to work um, as all of us change and grow over time. Again, broken leg, lifetime like me, in between. Like it, it gives us the ability to continue our life path and, and access life. And it's really a beautiful thing. And in my opinion, needs to be lifted up and you know protected and looked at as a freedom for all of us. Revered versus feared, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I love it. Hey, I just want to pause for a quick second and see, uh, Brittany, do we have any questions in the chat at this point? No, not at the moment. Okay, very good. Don't forget, folks, as you're listening, if you have any questions that bubble up, be sure to pop those into the chat, and we'll be monitoring that as we move through our discussion. But um, so, Alicia, let's kind of get back into things. And, um, I, you know, knowing the Americans with Disabilities Act was, you know, established to create that free and accessible life for everyone, regardless of ability or inability. Some of the, th you've mentioned the word punitive a couple of times. I think I said, you know, free versus fear. Um, one of the things I think that drives that fear is just a lack of understanding, um, maybe some bias that could potentially uh, exist. And as we prepared for this session, you and I had some discussions around, um, you know, bias and stigma. Can we jump into that topic for the next few minutes? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I guess if we wanna to touch on bias specifically itself, uh, bias, unconscious bias, stigma. What is bias? It's a prejudice. It's when we favor want something over something else, and it usually influences our behaviors. And unconscious bias is pretty much the same thing, but it's unknown. We don't realize we're doing it something because it's so ingrained in sort of what we have learned from our past. And stigma is I mean, the definition of stigma is, is, is a disgrace. Like it's associated to a, a circumstance or a quality in a person that is less than. And there's so many of these that surround disability. Mm -hmm. um, it's the lens that we see others through. Um, it's the lens that we see life through. It's the lens that we see impossible versus possible through. 
And these lens of perception, they're unique for each and every single one of us because it we are interpreting things from what we've learned in our past, from our childhood, our own life experiences. And it literally drives our decision consciously or subconsciously, scenarios in both, on whether we're going to include, whether we're going to hire, whether we're going to befriend, you know, whether we're going to love. And um, from a disability perspective, these stigmas, like they chased me around my entire life, you know, things like yeah. pity, exclusion, stereotyping, discrimination, marginalization, all these things that are like, oh, why is that following me? But it, it does, you know, and it's yeah. my greatest life challenge to try to turn those things off and remove those blockers to advance what we believe as possible in our society and at work yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You know, I remember from your, from your recent Ted talk, you mentioned how when you were born, the, uh, the, the stigma that existed in people's minds in regard to you and your situation was a big no. Like I remember you saying, doctors would tell your parents, she's not going to be functional. She's never going to have a normal life. She needs to be put in a home with others who are like her and kind of just like this picture shows you on the other side of everybody else. And I think that it's important that we understand whether we know it or not, these are they exist. All of us have bias, conscious or unconscious. All of us have stigma just because of what, you know, we see in media or how we were raised and how awful would it have been, Alicia, if your parents had listened to those naysayers and to given in to those stigmas that, that existed when you were a kid, because look at you now. I mean, you're as able as anybody I know. You guys, I, every time I talk to Alicia on the weekend, she's out for a run or she's, you know, out camping, like if she'd have been stuck in this place that the world wanted to put her in when she was born because of bias and stigma, we would have lost out on a huge opportunity to meet someone who is absolutely amazing and inspiring. So thanks and, for your- Well, I love that. And just a thing that, you know, there's so many babies like me when I was born that that's what happened. They are the hidden away, the forgotten ones. They never, they never- had a, a chance and I only had my chance because my parents decided to say no and like forge a new path that was less traveled towards something called inclusion because they knew we are better together than apart and if we start shifting our 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 thinking that way it just opens up a world of opportunity for everybody honestly I agree I'm going to go back to the the slide before this one here hang on because I think this quote here is awesome. Inclusion benefits all of us. It's a theory that offers us freedom to leverage life as we change over time, but it benefits all of us. It's so important to remember that. Yeah. All right. So before we move on to our next topic, Alicia and I agreed that it would be a great idea for us to take a stretch break. So I want you to stretch your arms. Come on, join me. Stretch. Uh, I don't know about you, but through this whole COVID thing, all these Zoom meetings and chats, you got to stretch. I'm going to get up out of my chair, stretch my arms, my legs, get the blood pumping again. I want you guys to do the same. Come on. That feels good. It does feel good. <laughs> all right. Now that we got the blood circul, you know, I'm a big proponent. The, the mind can only absorb what the butt can endure. So I'm glad we did that. <laughs> All right, um, just real quick, let's check the chat, see if we've got any questions or comments coming through. Yes, we have one question. It is from Christian Daniels. Is it hard when you have an unseen disability for the person to get accommodations needed for them to work, i.e. autoimmune, fibromyalgia, et cetera? And, and the question is, is it hard to do what? I'm sorry. It broke up for me. Is it hard when you have a unseen disability for the person to get a combination needed for them, for them to work, i.e. autoimmune, fibromyalgia, et cetera? Um, my answer to that would be, it's hard if you're not willing to share. Um, when we get, when we start talking about hiring, especially when it's disabilities that, you, that someone can't see, they're, they're not going to know unless you're, you're open about it. And um, 
this goes back to inclusion and understanding each other as collaborative and it takes communication. And so from where you, you're comfortable, what you're willing to share, we got to kind of meet in the middle. So the person who's potentially the hiring manager, they don't need to know everything. They don't need to know your deepest, darkest secrets that are behind the stuff that only your husband or wife would know. Um, but allowing them to um, in a little bit to understand what you need is, is extremely important in my opinion. Um, you know, you'll hear a lot of people say, it's not my job to teach. It's not my job to teach. Um, and I get that, but I also believe that we have to be willing to start being a little bit more open and having some conversations because nobody knows, nobody will know what works for me unless I am willing to start to have those conversations and, and give my truth, honestly. And for me, I used to hide my disability on my LinkedIn. I wouldn't show my wheelchair. I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want that stigma attached to me. I wanted to get hired. I overcome. And as I've become more confident um, as a woman and a professional, my, my disability is my power. And so you get there when you start talking about it and you start collaborating with people and allow them to learn, honestly. Yeah. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Yeah, and I'll just spin that for a quick uh, over to the to the multifamily space in terms of uh, reasonable accommodations and things like that. Like if someone presents that they have a need and that's all you need to know <laughs> uh, in terms of reasonable accommodations, uh, you should have a have a program in place at your company that helps you to manage those types of requests. They need to be made in writing. Um, we are a you know, equal housing opportunity for everyone. We're a fair housing partner um, and we've got a process in place to handle those reasonable accommodations, modifications. Um, and really you don't need to know the details from the site level. You just need to know that somebody's expressed that they have a need and you need to pass that need up the chain of command in the appropriate fashion so that we don't miss an opportunity to give somebody uh, access or a grab bar or a ramp or the types of things that some of our folks are in need of. And I think we want to manage to, uh, in, our, in our business, we manage to the exception a lot, folks who are trying to, you know, dupe the system or, you know, leverage a, a service animal so that they don't have to pay a pet fee. But those are the exception. Alicia is bringing to the conversation something that's so important in that the ADA Act was passed so that everyone has the freedom to get what they need to enjoy life the way everybody else has the opportunity to enjoy life. And I think that's important for us to kind of touch on too. That was a really great question. Thank you for asking it. Love. Yeah, appreciate that. Anything else in there, Brittany? Yes, we have one more. So right. Mary, Mary Gwen asked, um, said, what an amazing story and appreciate hearing your perspective. What do you think we as an industry could be doing better now? Hmm. Thanks, Mary. Um, I think as an industry, we're doing, we're doing really good. Like Steve was saying, we've got a lot of things in place over other industries, I'm sure, because we're dealing with housing and we need to make sure that we're accommodating people. Um, I think as an industry, and just in my life, what I need more personally is communication, like not being afraid to approach me. Um, I get a lot of people watching, staring, assuming, and it leaves us with, um, you know, thoughts that are not true. Like how terrible that Assumption. must be. Yeah. Assumptions. Thank you. And so I think as a whole, as a society and in our industry, we need to not be afraid to talk about these things and open up conversation, just like we are with the inclusion conversation with every other group right now. Like we need to open these conversations more, not be afraid to make mistakes, ask questions. And if somebody makes a mistake, the other person needs to forgive. Like we need to be collective um, and learn from each other. One of the things I love about your platform, Alicia, is not only are you, you know, talking to operators, owners, uh, organizations about uh, diversity and inclusion in terms of disability, but you're also, you're talking to your com community as well, saying we can't be angry, we can't be, uh, you know, we can't assume anything. It's the, it's like a two-sided coin, right? And I yeah. love that you're also helping to propel the conversations forward in the disability community to say, be more open, don't be so 
closed off. It's yeah. a different world. And, and when we're all open to that communication, which you mentioned is the key, I think that's going to make a huge difference for all of us. And one more thing just came to mind. Okay. I think what we also need to do in our industry a little bit, and I'm not in every training course or all it, those, like I'm on the vendor side, so I don't see a lot of that, but I have had a couple experiences and this is the extreme where I've been excused off properties because there's been some legal action and they don't want, you know, somebody in a wheelchair on their property and whatever it was. So anyways, that's an extreme, but I think like in our training protocols, like starting to tie in like the legal piece, because I'm sure you have to go over that, but also the humanity piece, yes. like the opening pathways for people to have homes and the beautiful honor that it is to accommodate. So everyone has that, that opportunity and spinning it in a little bit more of a positive way, I think would be helpful. Yeah, I agree. That's great. Mary, Mary Gwen, I hope we answered your question. Thanks so much for bringing that, bringing that to the conversation. Um, all right. So bias and stigma are a couple of words that are out there in the universe, Alicia, but there's also um, a few other words and, and we call this section the buzz because, you know, buzzwords are the words that are hot buttons and topics of discussion. So Alicia is going to walk us through a few of these hot buttons or the buzz and uh, give us a definition of what each one is, because until you know what it is, you won't know how to how to deal with it. Right. OK, yeah. so we're going to start off with this bad boy. Ableism. Ableism. So this is another ism, everyone. Yes, it is. And <laughs> it is a word that was created in the 60s and 70s during that disability rights movement. Uh, most people don't know what this word is. Um, it's what I just did my TED talk on. I'm super excited to have the opportunity to shed some light on it. Um, and ableism is basically a discrimination or a social prejudice against people with disabilities based on the belief that typical abilities are superior. And the reality is we are taught from the time we were born to favor one over the other sometimes, and that we don't necessarily see the beauty in every shape that it comes in. And ableism is everywhere you turn. It's in my life too. It is so ingrained in our society, so ingrained in the way we think about disability that she would be so much better if, or it would be so much better if I could. Um, that we don't, we do not even realize it's there. It's overlooked, it goes unnoticed, but without recognizing that it's there, um, we don't really ever have a, a, an opportunity to really be fully inclusive. And so starting to look at people with disabilities, like they would be, be they, you know, instead of they would be better if she could walk, that no, like this is how she is and this is her. Um, and really starting to turn off that ableism um, of thinking that we all need to be a certain way to be happy or productive or uh, perfect in our own eyes. Yep. So you're not less of a person because of your exactly. situation. You are exactly who you're supposed to be. And yeah. that is wonderful and beautiful, right? And uh, examples of ableism in my life is really things like the no ways, absolutely not, don't exclude. Um, you know, it's those fear and pity lenses that sort of surround what we think about disability. Yeah, for that sure. That paints a picture at all. Okay, that's a good definition. And thanks for some of those real, I, I do love you giving those real life examples because I think it's important for people to hear how it's played off for you in your perspective. Um, here's our next one, inclusion. So inclusion, we are hearing it all the time, inclusion and diversity, we muddy them together. I always, when I'm speaking to companies, I always, separate them because I think it's important to understand what they are individually. Inclusion is an act. It is something that we decide that we're going to do. And it's when we are, you know, it's the state of including the relationship between two classes when we're including one in, and the other in both. Um, inclusion, while closely related to diversity, is different. Diversity is us. It's, it's what makes us unique. Um, it's so diversity is basically who we are and inclusion is the act of including all of those diversities in what we do. Love it. All right. Next one. Oh, oh. Well, there you have it. Diversity. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> right next to each other. <laughs> We've got that one covered, right? Yep, we do. And the last one. 
this is this is one that um, I think is fairly new to the conversation um, in terms of you know it was D D and I forever diversity and inclusion now it's D E and I which is diversity equity and inclusion so um, let's define it first Alicia and then I want you to give like an example of what does equity look like in the multifamily space when it comes to you and, and your situation? Okay. Um, so equity recognizes each person that we have differences, but it allocates the resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. Um, it's different than equality where we look at each individual group as the same, and we give them the same resources, the same opportunities, and we expect to have the same outcome, which is impossible. We're all different. We're all diverse, disability or not. Yeah. And inclusion was born out of inequity where we've started to realize that something is, when if something is not fair or right, um, and we can clearly see that a group or a person is being marginalized or left out or excluded because of their difference. And so inclusion, um, you know, when we want to successfully achieve it in an environment, um, we're treating people fairly. We are trying to give them the resources that they need to have an even playing field where everyone has access to opportunities. It might be in a different way, um, but to reach a similar goal. Um, and I also think it's important to understand that inclusion is a global and I look at it from and relate it to mobility, variability, disability, accessibility, and fitting in. But these words, um, they are tied into any marginalized group. And um, you know, the world that we're living today is propelled by technology. So we're seeing these things now, we're understanding them, we're starting to accept them, we're learning, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so. It's almost like equity gives you a seat at the table. It just doesn't matter how you got there. Yeah, and once you have a seat at the table, you're given the opportunity and the resources that you need to continue to be at the table. You know, yeah. like, um, it's like if you invited me to go to a restaurant and we're having dinner, um, but it's upstairs and I don't have an elevator. And why would we do that? Like, it's not there. Like I can't get there. And so finding the way to accommodate for people, humans, so they can all be there is important and what yeah. we need to do. For sure. All right. So four big words, four very powerful words that have a real opportunity to influence somebody's life experience, especially uh, in, in the multifamily space. Um, I think we've got some good definitions and some good examples. Um, just want to touch base with Brittany to see if we've got any questions before we move on to one of my very favorite parts of your platform. We don't have any questions. We do have a few comments. Um, love, love that my disability is my power. Huh. Um, my godson has um, cerebral palsy and it's been great to see how his family has normalized his CP. And they always have kept him in regular schools and it helps others when they are exposed to these disabilities. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. That makes me so happy. <laughs> makes Milo Inclusion. happy too. Yes. Love it. I can hear Milo in the background barking. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> when Alicia gets excited, her little dog goes crazy. All right. So, we um, have, oh, sorry. We have one no, question that just popped up from Tara Samuels. Do you have any practical strategies for creating an inclusive environment? There's there's a lot of practical st strategies. There's um, specifically, um, I pr was probably gonna touch on it in the end, but there are resources where you can, you know, definitely have an outline of um, things like, hold on, let me, I wanna pull up my notes so I get this right. Um, uh, I apologize. Seven pillars of inclusion, access, attitude, choice, partnership, communication, policy, opportunities. There's some really great resources online that are all about kind of framing um, inclusion at work and also in life. Like, what do you need to focus on? And so 
Um, uh, I really love the seven pillars of inclusion, but there's definitely other resources online that you can find. And I would also reach out to your HR departments. Like what is so beautiful that's going on right now is companies are implementing these programs. They're sewing them into processes and we're learning a lot about this stuff right now. So really good. And if you go to NAA, NAA's website, there is a whole diversity and inclusion kit and caboodle full of good resources, webinars, um, forums, and recommendations, and uh, links to other websites that'll provide you all with. NAA has given us a really great uh, repository of resources, so we'd like to say thank you very much for that as well. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So this is my favorite part of your platform, Alicia, and it's it's your it's your real message and it's called the heart of inclusion. And I um, want to give us our last um, like 10 minutes or so on this piece before okay. we jump into our live Q and a again, if there's any questions, but um, let's, I'm going to turn it over to you and, and just kind of share with us this idea around the heart of inclusion and what that can mean for our folks. Okay. Um, I think we need to like first frame a little bit, like how can we do better moving forward as leaders in our industry? And, you know, we just need to start taking a look at who we are, what we have, how we've gotten it, how we've gotten there. And most importantly, how are we treating and acknowledging people along the way? And there's that humanity piece to this. Like, Mm -hmm. Your HR departments are going to give you the structure of how to implement these things. But what I have found in my life and in my experience with this is if we are not starting to care about the human being first, it's so simple, but to have a relationship with them, collaborate, learn, um, you know, we're, we, we're not as successful in our inclusion efforts because we, we don't, we're missing the person altogether. Um, And so from a company standpoint and just like, we need to start shifting our goals and move away from uh, uh, ends justifies the means and um, start realizing that if we're not trying to include everyone in our process, we're missing out on this like great opportunity of collaboration and growth within our organizations. Um, And we need to understand inclusion is hard work. It's Mm -hmm. hard for you. And it's hard for me. Collective. It is ongoing. It is not a box that we check off and move on. And it's different in every situation. And we have to be open to be adaptable and to collaborate and learn and relearn what we've been taught. And um, we, again, we need to not be afraid to make mistakes. We need to be bold with our questions. We need to be Um, open with our answers. And we need to realize that, you know, this is going to take a lot of ongoing effort. Um, And the the key to all of this, in my opinion, is communication, adaptability, um, and practice and we and believing in possible and and we have to keep practicing. It's like a dance. It's takes two or more. We have to be vulnerable. We have to practice. We have to understand this is hard work, but just like anything that we work really hard on, eventually it becomes a habit and it's executed naturally and beautifully. And over time, we're breaking down biases. We're breaking down stereotypes and we are opening a world of opportunity for everyone. And the truth about all of this is there's plenty of inclusion for everyone. Um, And as I find myself pivoting in this new, amazing speaking role that I can't even believe I have this opportunity to do it, (laughs) I I do it, I'm like, "Ah, I get another chance. Um, I know I'm making some deep impact. I'm widening those doors and I'm broadening perspectives. And it's just simple. Uh, Like what we need to understand is inclusion for me is about love. It's about respect. It's about caring. It's about doing what we can for each other, enabling pathways for someone else. And the hardest part of all, we got to work on it together. We ha- we, it, we're not successful if we don't. And in doing that, we're recognizing and celebrating our differences and seeing that they're core to what make us strong and powerful and qualified and sought after and all of these amazing things instead of being our limitation that we're trying to hide from. Um, and so, you know, my tagline is see me, See me for me. Don't look at the wheelchair. Focus on me and what I can bring to the table. 
Um, and, and, and that's it. We got it. We really just have to care about each other and it's going to break down all of these pre preconceived notions that we have, um, you know, potentially. I love it. I love it. And I love, I think this picture of, of you playing tug of war is like <laughs> the perfect example of what inclusion, equity, uh, all stands for because a lot of people would have looked at that situation and said, oh, she she won't want to do that or she can't do that. And to see that you were in a in a world that allowed you the opportunity to prove them wrong, which I think is so amazing. And another thing is it's hard work. Like this <laughs> isn't easy. No. We have to be vulnerable and yeah. open. And that yeah. takes a lot of effort. Yeah. Every single, for me, it's every day, every single day, whether I'm at the grocery store or I'm presenting in front of a large client, you know, it's yeah. every day. Um, it's work. It is work. And I think too, it's, it's a bit scary. So, you know, kind of putting on my multifamily glasses and, and remembering what it was like to be a leasing consultant on site and, you know, being fearful of fair housing and being fearful of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person, um, I think the idea of seeing the person first is going to kind of help to overcome some of those fears that folks in our listening audience might have. And, you know, really having the same kind of conversation with everybody is, is the key. And really, I, I was thinking back my multifamily experience. I've been in the business for almost 30 years, you guys. Wow. And I worked on site for a long time, uh, probably at least 10 years. And I can remember one disabled uh, person, mobily disabled person that lived at a community that I worked at. And I can remember one hearing impaired family that lived at a community that I worked at. I can't remember any others. And Alicia, you and I were talking, like think, at, think about the last NAA convention that we had in person on the trade show floor. I didn't see anybody yeah. that looked like you. And I think we've we've created this kind of barrier to folks and we've limited their ability to really experience that equitable free for all life that the Americans with Disabilities Act really was designed to create. And so I'm hopeful that even with just this, we've only touched the tip of the iceberg in this conversation today, but I'm hopeful that it's kind of started the wheels turning in folks' minds. For those of you that are leaders of organizations, I hope that it's really gotten you to think differently about um, inclusion and what that looks like and feels like to folks like Alicia and how you can potentially change and grow. And I think you have a, uh, the, the tagline into this se section for us, Alicia, was how can we do better moving into tomorrow? Yeah. And I think it starts with conversations like this that aren't easy. We don't have all the answers, but it, just takes us having the conversation to get things started. It totally does. And the one thing I want to note on that, you don't see very many people like me in our industry. When I, I want everybody to recognize and know that um, it's not just your job, it's all of our jobs. We yes. need to be willing to hire, try and see. And I also have to be willing to go for it. It's collaborative. This is a relationship. Um, and so I want to note that, but yeah, we definitely need to see more like me in our industry, that's for sure. <laughs> well, no, I think they broke the mold when they made you. So, oh, we're, we're... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Actually, they didn't because you've got an identical twin. Yeah. <laughs> and hi, Regina, if you're listening, I think you're here. So, uh, all right, um, Brittany, let's jump in and see if we had any comments or questions come up. We have had one that says, Attitude is my favorite, and no questions as of right now. Say that one more time. Attitude is my favorite. It's one of the comments that came in. Thanks, yeah. Deborah. <laughs> She's definitely and got the attitude. You are fierce. Definitely are. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, we left some time for Q&A. If you guys are going to be quiet, we might talk some more. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but... Uh, um, I feel good about conversations and I hope that you guys do as well. I think for me, the big deal is like, don't be afraid of it. 
Like I remember I used to teach some leasing classes and I used to be like, you know, fair housing was designed to give everybody the same right to housing. It doesn't mean you can't get to know somebody, you know, and to understand what their needs are. And, um, you know, how do you feel about that, uh, Alicia, in terms of like what that what that conversation would would sound like or feel like for you to feel like, hey, this is really somebody's really out for my best interest. They really are trying to help me, you know, find a home. What kind of advice would you give to folks that are in that position? Because it is, I mean, it, it is scary for people. And I want to want to acknowledge that. But I think you could provide some insight into at least how you would want to be treated in that situation. I mean, I just want to be approached and for somebody to say, how are you? Who are you? Tell me about what you need. And, and those conversations start organically. It's yeah. really, people are very afraid to approach me and, and, and ask questions. And I get it. It is scary. It's, it's, it goes back to that. This is really personal stuff. And you have to yeah. find your boundaries, all of us, on what we're willing to share and what we're not willing to share. But, um, you know, little kids, they approach me and they'll say, like, tell me about you. And I'll tell them and then they move on. And so if we are having those open conversations and not shushing, you know, and not teaching that you shouldn't talk about this, this is something that is off, you know, limits. Um, we're going to continue to open those conversations and start to get more comfortable with it. it. It goes back to that practice, like dip your toe in the water, you know, yeah. like try when I've been frankly excused off properties and things like that, when I'm trying to sell my software, um, you know, I take that as an opportunity for me, like, okay, I understand, like, let's sit outside and have a conversation. And so we just need to start being open. And it's that's so simple, like, but yeah. it's so true. It, it literally is like, say hello in a yeah. real way, like, look, look me in the eye and, and see me experience me and don't worry about all the other stuff until we yeah. like start having a conversation. So the whole concept of get personal before you get to business is going to be important for folks. I to... mean, I think it's important in life. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. I agree completely human regardless human of who contact. you're talking to. Yeah. I, I mean, I live for human contact. So maybe, maybe that's me. I don't know. But I, I think that again, once we start to know somebody, um, we put in additional work. Like my sister would never leave me on the sidelines ever you know and yeah. vice versa and that's because we care about each other and so it's just that that relationship um building relationships is super important and i think there was some intentional planning too i mean i think it's important for folks in the audience like don't wait for a moment to happen i always say there are moments that matter and there are moments that splatter <laughs> right so don't wait for a moment to happen and you're not prepared you know, think about buildings that we manage that were built in the 30s and the 40s and the 60s that were not designed the way that they are, were from the point that the ADA Act was passed. So if your leasing office is upstairs and there's not an elevator in your building, what are you going to do when somebody rings the bell and they're downstairs in a, in a wheelchair like, like Alicia? Get your butt out of your chair and be ready. Have a plan. How are you going to meet that person where they are? and provide them with the same level of care, attention, and personal uh, service that you would otherwise, right? Don't wait for it to happen. Start looking at things now and be prepared. Uh, and Alicia's got tons of ideas. You guys, if you're in the audience and you want to continue the conversations, she's all, she's all about that. And she loves to help. It. All about it. Um, as am I. And oh, as we're so is cute together. <laughs> As is Brittany, and Brittany's, you know, one of our affiliates with NAA, and it's awesome to know that we've got partners in all the markets that we operate properties in that are full of resources and places you can turn to. So, um, you know, always be prepared. Be good Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and be prepared. Don't be afraid. Um, I hope that this conversation today has been valuable for you. Um, I am proud to share the time with uh, Alicia and Brittany, uh, especially Alicia, just because I love how you're shining light. Uh, that's why we called this an illumination proclamation. I you know, let's shine some light on something that's been dark and scary for so long and be like, 
that's what it is well what's the big deal let's just work together and be collaborative and communicate and love one another and and make a, a great experience for everybody in the world let yeah, me and, say how you're doing yeah. thank <laughs> you to everybody who cared enough to like give us your time today and even have a moment and to to experience this we i i personally really appreciate it it means a lot to me so thank you so much hey yeah. steve and alicia we have just a few questions that came in while you guys were talking and i would love to um honor their questions great when was, when was the last time you felt seen and that's from tara i feel seen most of the time now i, I like honestly there's uh, there's moments here or there that um i'm excluded for one reason or the other um and that's really where i get that i've been when i'm excused and or not looked at for me as a person but I'm motivational speaking all over the place now, so I feel seen. I'm so excited to get my <laughs> message out. Um, but I think a lot of us feel unseen sometimes in our own lives. And so it's just breaking through that. And how do we overcome that? Um, so yeah, I don't have a specific right now off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm feeling seen. <laughs> That's for sure. How about right now? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have the question, what do you foresee for organizations that do not begin to transfer, transform their business to an inclusive culture? I think companies are starting to recognize the competitive value of it, um, whether it's from hiring and employees, you know, want to work at a more diverse company or if they want to, you know, have an option to ha have a greater seat and be more visible at the table. Um, we're in this really cool time of our lives right now that this, I can't believe like how much focus is on diversity and inclusion. We're creating departments and job roles. And we're in this beautiful moment right now where companies are really trying. There's a lot to learn and a lot along. I have companies reaching out to me constantly. Like, can, can we talk? Like, how do I um, accomplish these things? Because it's a lot to know and it's a lot to learn. Um, so I think I think moving forward, it's become something that that is a major focus for a lot of companies um, to include because of because of the value proposition and and um, we're just all starting to see that it's it's super important. Um, so I think eventually, if you're not having a, a portion of that in within your organization, it might be you know something that 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 is leaving you behind a little bit in a tiny way. I don't know, Steve. Do you have thoughts there? You, you might miss out on hiring somebody fabulous like Alicia. Oh, really? You might miss yeah. out on, you know, people are drawn, especially millennials, they're drawn to companies that have a social, um, a social mission to give back to the communities that, that we operate in and to be a voice for those who don't have a voice. Um, I think that's important. And I think businesses will lose some opportunities if they don't start having these conversations now. Just my right. <laughs> One last question. Does NAA have classes for acquiring self-employed landlords or property managers to learn about more laws or guidelines for disability acts and tenant landlord laws? That is a great question. And I will say yes with a caveat. Um, I know that there are certification programs like CAM uh, the, the CAPS certification for a property portfolio supervisor, um, diversity and inclusion would be part of all of those platforms. Um, there is an actual diversity and inclusion council, which Brittany is actually a member of at the National Apartment Association. Um, if you're going to the apartmentalized conference in Chicago at the end of August, there will be several panel discussions around diversity and inclusion, not only from an HR perspective, but just from a how to create a conscious community of inclusion at your property kind of perspective. So there's a ton of resources. Um, I know Stephanie is still here. Stephanie, is there any other insight that you can share regarding um, the tools and resources that NAA provides in, in this particular vernacular? Uh, in regards to certification programs, we don't have any that are for DNI at this point. Uh, we do have the resources page, um, and I know that DNI has been incorporated, like you said, into a lot of our credentialing programs. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Visto, go with visto.org. 
they are, there are some courses there as well. And, you know, leverage your resources. A lot of you have a learning management system or a learning management partner like Grace Hill or edge to learn or some of the others that are out there in our space. There's, you know, classwork available there. And if, if you need a certification, start one, create one, mm -hmm. have one in your organization, get together and talk about what's diversity and inclusion and equity going to look like in our organization. And what can we do to then help people achieve that particular vision or, or, um, vision that you have for what it's going to look like at your company. I think yeah, that would be I a great place to start. I think visualizing the need and the interest is huge. So yeah. asking these questions from NAA, from your organizations, from our industry, like that's what's going to bring more and more resources. So use your voices. That's good stuff. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that's our time. Stephanie, I'm going to turn it over to you. You've got a few announcements. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Brittany. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just have one last thing to say to Brittany. Bless your heart. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Iconic Southern. <laughs> She's from the all South right. in case you're wondering what that's all about. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much to Alicia and Steve for, for presenting this incredible webinar and for and to Brittany for moderating. And thanks to all of you that joined us today. I want to take this time now to make sure you all save the date for our PM Careers Week. That will take place between July 12th through the 16th. Uh, we encourage you to check out naahq.org forward slash RPM Careers Week to learn about the week's activities and how you can get involved. And lastly, next slide, Steve. Uh, I want to make you aware of two uh, diversity and inclusion opportunities that we're currently offering. The Alexandra Jack U. Uh, diversity and Inclusion Scholarship and the Innovation and Diversity and Inclusion IDI grant. Uh, you can check out naahq.org forward slash diversity hyphen inclusion for more information on these programs. Uh, the deadline to apply for both is July 30th. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.